Intermission. The Self. In the prologue to this book, we briefly discussed determinism. Now I would like to pause before moving on with part two and talk a little bit about the self. This is the self we know ourselves to be. Yourself has been around since your birth. In all the revolutions our selves have made around the sun, we've learned things. We've learned specific ways of interacting with our environment, ways that work, ways that pay out, ways that get us the things we want, and ways that get us away from the things that suck. As teenagers, we might be rude to our parents, but in public we say, yes sir, or yes ma'am. Or maybe it's the opposite. We cringe around our parents and are rude to strangers. Either way, different context, different behavior. Let's call this our learning history or our conditioning. This learning history is why we are Lady Gaga or Tom Hardy fans. It is why we subscribe to abstract concepts like religion saves or smoking is cool. It's why there are Boston accents where there are Boston accents and Farsi speakers where there are Farsi speakers. This self is with us and will be with us until the day we die. But it is adaptable. Praise Jesus and Allah. I chew tobacco. I threw up the first time I tried it. My father chewed tobacco. The older guys I played baseball with and looked up to chewed tobacco. There were multiple tobacco chewing models in my life that I imitated. So I persevered. A lot of momentum in chewing tobacco. 20 years later, while I write this, I am chewing tobacco. I copied others in my environment. I now have a long learning history of tobacco chewing. And in the next section, I aim to break this chain or write about the ideas that will lead to my future self breaking his tobacco chain. Because after all, it is my future self that is in jeopardy, or so my present self tells himself. Maybe you're not a tobacco user, but you've at least known someone who's had a baby. Babies and tobacco. We currently have a baby on the way, and Lauren and I are trying to think of a solid name. Whenever a new name is thrown in the hat, someone in the room always shares their conditioning related to the name being discussed. Matilda? Guess she's going to dream of one day becoming a maid. Simone? No way. She'll be a smoker by the fourth grade. Mallory? LOL. Are you kidding me? You're going to name her after a witch? Blag. Crickets. There's no one anywhere who has a history with this name. The one exception being my friend who created it. Maybe we will have the first Blag child. And she will be the model of what Blag stands for. Blag, the proc doer. As for the other names mentioned, half of the conditioning related to people's suggestions, I do not even understand. That is because I have a different learning history pertaining to names. Your learning history with cool Rick could be a very different experience from my experience with someone also named Rick. My Rick was a cocky, overly authoritative slob of a man, or at least that was my experience with Rick. While your cool Uncle Rick was playing bumper bowling with you, my Rick was probably pissing and moaning a bit like how real coffee is supposed to be made. Understanding more about ourselves and our learning history will allow us to peek behind the curtain and see who or what is pulling our strings. Observing our strings being pulled does not have to lead to an existential crisis, but we need to realize that some of our behavior has a long learning history and will not change overnight. As they say, you can't break an old dog's chains. Knowing more about our behavior, where and when it started, and what has maintained this behavior can help us design our environment in ways that remove strings we no longer want to be pulled. A better understanding of our conditioning 
allows us to step outside ourselves and view our behavior from a distance, to detach. This idea of detachment works better with a metaphor of a bicycle chain. If a bicycle chain is too long or has too many links, it will not engage the bike's gears and the wheels will not turn. We literally must step back away from the bicycle to observe what's happening. Then, by detaching unnecessary links, we will be able to reconnect the chain to the bike in a way that is efficiently engaging the gears, turns the wheels, and gets us to where we want to be. This is necessary if we're going to accurately view the chains that bind us, the good and the bad. My tobacco problem is not an addiction. It's not a disease. At the very least, these are not the most pragmatic ways to think about my tobacco problem if I'm going to solve it. It's simpler. There's a link in my chain that has a long history of being reinforced. The link goes where this book goes. I wrote this book as a help self book. I wrote it to you, but for me. There are enough books on the market today telling you what to do. I know, I read a few of these self-helpish books every year. These books are written because an author somewhere thinks you and I need to learn something new. Their books were written to help us in a particular way, not this book. It might seem like I'm talking directly to you, and at times, I am. But my motivation for writing this book is to help me. If it's a model for you to use in your life, well, that makes me super happy. Beat you imitating my tobacco habit. If it gives you a new insight into your behavior, then right on, man. But its real purpose is for me to work on my chains. A Buddhist teacher once said, We learn to make bread by putting dough in the oven. If the dough is mushy, we keep it in the oven. If the bread is burnt, we learn to take it out of the oven earlier. But we only know this by baking bread again and again. We only learn to change our behavior by observing our behavior as it interacts with our environment. Then we will come to understand why our behavior is or is not occurring and how to appropriately adjust the environmental variables interacting with our behavior. This book is me writing about the process of baking myself. I would love for there to be a new genre of books called Help Self Books. If you decide to begin working on yourself in an experimental or culinary way, then write about it. Power to the people! Make it funny, make it sad, but don't forget the formula. Forget writing to make the New York Times bestseller list. With that being said, uh, there will not be enough copies of this book to become a New York Times bestseller, so you better hurry and go buy you and your families and friends a copy before they're all gone. Seriously, I think there are only like 50 copies left. Oh, and one other thing about the self and its conditioning. Everyone freaks out when we talk about conditioning, determinism, and such as it applies to them. Listen, you can be ignorant or play dumb in this arena, but if it is not you manipulating yourself, I can promise you someone else is. That Bezos dude is not becoming a Brazilianaire by asking some Florida psychic what ads to put in front of our eyes. Nope. He and the rest of those app creators know our learning history. And so far, it turns out that making predictions based on our behavior patterns is a winning bet. Another Buddhist monk said, We study Buddhism to study the self. We study the self to forget the self. For our purposes, I think Master Dogen would allow us to say, We observe the self to observe our chains. We observe our chains to learn better ways to chain ourselves. I know, it has a ring to it. Maybe by the end of this Help Self book, I will have a better way to say it. I'm no Dogen. On with the show!